Thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, everyone, for coming to this evening's um, lecture on the UK media and the police to be given by uh, the renowned documentary filmmaker Roger Grafe. Um, uh, this uh, has been organised by uh, the Media Standards Trust and by the Policy Institute at King's. Um, after the talk, I should say, there's going to be a reception uh, just down the corridor on the left-hand side uh, in the chapters um, uh, with some free wine and soft drinks and, I'm told, canapes, so do come and join us there. Um, my name's Martin Moore. I'm the director of the Media Standards Trust. Uh, it's an uh, independent non-profit think tank uh, based here at King's who are linked to the Policy Institute, uh, although independent of it. Um, this is the second in a series of talks that we're, we're doing on the media and public policy. Um, the first, for those who weren't there, was in May uh, and was given by Baroness Helena Kennedy and was on the Press and the Human Rights Act. Um, the purpose of the series is to better understand the relationship uh, between uh, the media and power um, and particularly to understand the complexities of the interrelationship between the media and uh, public authorities and institutions. And the UK media, I think it's fair to say, has had a long and uh, pretty complex relationship with the police. Uh, a huge amount of what we see and hear and read is about crime. And this is true across genres. So I'm not just talking here about the news media. I'm talking particularly about uh, drama uh, and documentaries uh, and particularly much broadcast output. Uh, do come in. There's lots of seats. Uh, you might need to squeeze on the ends. And recently, the relationship between the UK media, especially the UK news media and the police, has come under uh, quite a lot of scrutiny. The uh, revelations that sparked the Leveson inquiry showed the relationship between the police and one news group, News International, were, in the words of the leading counsel for the inquiry, Robert J., at best inappropriately close, and if not actually corrupt, very close to it. And in the last two years, we've seen uh, the relationship further questioned over the Plebgate affair uh, with Andrew Mitchell at Downing Street, the uh, actions of the police in Rotherham and Rochdale, and the raid on Cliff Richard's home this summer, uh, where the South Yorkshire police collaborated closely with the BBC. And most recently, we've seen rising concern about the police's use of REPA uh, legislation to access the phone records of journalists threatening the anonymity of journalistic sources. Uh, but I think it's entirely fair to say there are few people better equipped to talk about the relationship between the UK media and the police than Roger Grafe. Uh, Roger has a remarkable uh, biography and documentary-making history, and I can uh, certainly not do it any justice in its very brief introduction. Um, but he's been making documentary films for over 50 years. Um, many of these films... Sorry, just 50 years. <laughs> um, many of the films have had a profound effect, not just on the public, uh, but on public policy, and I think he will, he will talk about that. Uh, he's won many, many awards over the years, but most recently he was, uh, there, was a, there was a BAFTA tribute last year, and uh, just this year he won the Sheffield Documentary Festival Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, in many of the documentaries that he's done, he has gained access to places where no one has previously filmed, um, uh, and, and remarkable footage from there. When it comes to the police themselves, he's made over 50 films about the police, including the enormously influential film uh, called Police in 1982, uh, Operation Carter, and In Search of Law and Order, amongst many, many others. He's also a criminologist, criminologist and writer. Uh, Roger will speak for probably uh, 30 to 45 minutes, uh, then I'll open for questions and answers, uh, after which, as I say, uh, please do come and join us in a reception down the hall. But um, now I would like you to join me in welcoming Roger Gray. Thank you, Martin. Um, <clears throat> who will know if this mic is working well enough? People in the back row, can you hear? You can hear, all right, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm slightly losing my voice, so I'm sorry about that. I, it may be shorter than 45 minutes if I, if I get totally silent. And that actually happened to me in a speech I was giving about communication, in which I had lost, it was the fourth speech in two days, and I really had completely lost 
and there was this mic and I had a neck mic and I had to whisper and everybody was kind of in the back row and I said look guys you know if you don't come to the front you're not going to hear anything and it was all about listening because I just realized that was the only thing I could talk about was the fact that you know well I, it, when you're talking it doesn't mean other people are listening basically um, and that's a, a if you're interested in that subject, I did a TED talk on that subject too, which I really enjoy because it's a triumph of hope over experience. You know, you realize that people are not actually likely to um, pay as close attention as you hope they will. Anyway, I hope you will tonight because I've got something I hope original to say about this. Uh, Martin has already pr produced the kind of litany of embarrassment, although you didn't really mention the hacking scandal, um, which we could talk about all night. Uh, and is very indicative of the relationship that uh, you described. But what I want to do is provide a theoretical basis for this relationship, which I hope you will find interesting. Now, the first theoretical um, framework for this is game theory, in which in cooperative game theory, both parties know the rules, know the outcomes, know the risks, and know the benefits. And it seems to me that the police and the media are locked together like Paolo and Francesca and Dante's Inferno, forever whirled, whirling around um, uh, in space, but uh, yeah, incapable of uncoupling. Now, in Dante, that's hell. But here, it's not heaven, but it is mutually beneficial, which is why they keep doing it and have done it for 100 years and more. Now, the point about that is what they have created by doing this together is the, my second theory, which is the parallel universe. Uh, they've created a parallel universe in which crime is the centerpiece of police work, and moreover, they catch the criminals most of the time, and crime also is done by criminals. In fact, the reality is completely different. First of all, crime is not their main task. Keeping order is their main task. Secondly, uh, most of the calls that are made to 999 are not about crime. The study that was done in the 80s on this showed that 90% of the calls were not about crime to Scotland Yard. But so many have, that has consistently been true, that this new uh, non-urgent line 111 has been created really to try and hive off the calls about lost cats, lost children, I mean, things that, are, you know, fires and um, leaks. I and mean, you'd be amazed. They ring up to people ring up to say, "I can't unscrew the top on this jar. Can you? Do you have any advice?" You know. I mean, it is really. I'm not joking. It's absolutely all human life is on those 999 calls. But crime is not very prominent, and you wouldn't know that if you listen to the sort of propaganda. If you like. Um, then, sec thirdly, the, the business about not solving the crime that is there is really important and very interesting, and. Some of you, have, I'm just going to ask, how many people in the room have ever heard of the rate of attrition? One person, two people. Right. It's not a widely known fact. But if it goes like this, that for every 100 crimes with victims, only 50 are reported, roughly. And this is round numbers. Right? Of the 50 that are reported, only about 40, 35, depends on the crime, are recorded. Okay? So the police statistics are for recorded crime, not reported crime. That's an important distinction. Then, out of the recorded crime, the, det uh, the um, detection rates vary between POWIS, which is the highest because they know who exactly who does what to who, and the MET, which is what's at least, last time I looked, the lowest at about 20%. Okay? So of the 40% that's recorded, only something between 20 and 35, 40% is detected. Now, detected doesn't mean punished or convicted or processed even. And if you take that further, you get down to an unbelievably low 3% of that 40% that is punished in court. And of that, 2% plead guilty, but only less than 1% go to prison. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Right? So out of that 100, one person effectively is going to prison. And the point about that is the prisons are full, that the rhetoric about crime pr promoted both by the police and certainly by the media is what we need are more prisons and then crime will stop. And in fact, it certainly won't make us any safer. We will have X number of people inside um, for a while that costs us a great deal of money. It, 
I did the numbers when I was first writing my book about young offenders and realized that it was roughly equivalent to the fees. It was actually about the same as sending somebody to Eton or Winchester for a year for, for young, the cost of a young offender's place. And um, also a normal prison thing would be like putting everybody up at the Ritz. Now, the, w those of us who believe in um, radical solutions said, why don't you just give them the money? Right? They don't have to steal it. They can invest it. You can suggest what the terms would be. But what, it, what you aren't going to do is stop them from stealing by putting them in prison, where even the Tories in 1990 published a, an orange paper, as they called it. It wasn't white in those days. I don't know why this was orange. But it was, it was the prelude to the wonderful Criminal Justice Act of 1991 that began, first nine, unforgettable, Prison is an expensive way of making bad people worse. How's that? Great, isn't it? I mean, unforgettable. Who can argue with that, right? Except that, you know, Michael Howard immediately, four years later, said prison works, immediately said prison is, sorry, pol uh, crime is the centerpiece of police work and they shouldn't be doing anything else. And that parallel universe in which those, are, those facts are, the, real, the reality is ignored, but this kind of crime... Um, factory, if you like, of both criminals and, and the criminal justice system uh, is mutually reinforced all the time. Now, it's what I call a loop of disinformation, because unless you've done what I've done or have indeed have been an ordinary policeman on the beat, you will think that is true. And you also will get your information not just from journalism, although we can go into that in a moment, but from fiction on television particularly, also in the movies. And I was giving a talk on this a few years ago um, at the Cambridge Institute of, of Criminology, and I just on, literally on the train up there, borrowed somebody's evening standard and counted the number of cop shows that were on satellite as well as terrestrial. I'll start with terrestrial and ask, this is that, you know, just channels one, BBC, BBC one, two, ITV, and channel four at that point, right? No satellite, nothing else. I want to guess how many cop shows were on just those channels in one night in prime time. Come on. Ten. You were right. Ten is right. Ten is. There were ten shows on terrestrial. But then we had in the satellite and, uh, and cable. Now, who, what do I hear? Come on. No, no. Hundreds too much. You're, that's way out of line. Now, it's 57, though. How's that? Right? Counting the, that ten. And that's a random Thursday night you know, for no, with no particular peg, no crime season, no reason to be showing that many films. Of the 57, a couple were called the traffic cops and helicopter cops and so sky cops are called, in which the reality of police work is cut so fast that you would think they were always busy. Whereas the real, anybody who knows or has been on the beat with a copper knows that it's a mixture of stress and boredom. Right? Now, that's serious. I mean, boredom. The mixture of stress and boredom is not healthy. Any psychologist will tell you that. It's a really bad combination. So what happens as you are bored but stressed? And stress comes, by the way, from expecting the radio to, to buzz and something really horrible to be announced, although most of the time it's nothing like that. But the anxiety level means the cortisol level is high. Okay? So that when something bad does happen, it can be across the county if you're a provincial copper. And the film that's running in your head with you at the centerpiece as this heroic cop <coughs> inspires you to cross, as indeed uh, I watched, Hampshire cops cross the entire county to a pub fight because the night was so boring, there was nothing else going on. And by the time they got there, the fight had long since stopped and indeed the local cops had dealt with it. But they come bursting in and say, right, up against the wall. Who's, you know, I, and, they think, and they do what is, was then also you know, uh, far from euphemistically as the John Wayne syndrome, right? They really, do, I mean, that's a syndrome, right? This is not just me being metaphorical. Cops that joined because they loved the excitement gave away their uh, uh, attitude by the way they walked. And the motorcycle cops in the Met, particularly. But this is so funny. You'd see them coming to the canteen with their caps, the visor of their caps, broken, right? 
in, with shades on, and the motorcycle boots kept on, even though normally you would think they would take them off. And they'd be sitting there looking. They were called black rats by the rest of the cops, actually. And I just think, I mean, you know, what movie were they in? Some L.A. cop movie, right? But, but... <laughs> What happens to L.A. cops, and this is very well uh, described by Joseph Wemba, who you may have known, the Onion Fields, people like, you know, the Knights, you know, Black Knight, brilliant uh, thrillers. I commend them to you highly. He said, it's what we now know very familiarly as red mist, right? When you get the call, the red mist, the excess of cortisol hits, the, you know, the boredom gives way to stress, and you suddenly are not thinking clearly anymore. You know, your head is just so full of this um, energy, fear, and uh, anticipation. And the movie is running, you know, faster, sort of 70 frames a second <laughs> instead of 24, because the mo- they're anticipating what they're going to find, okay? That movie is running in their heads. So when they get there, they make it happen. Even if everything's over, it's all calm, it's not what they expect. So the media... Influence isn't just by giving stories and getting stories. It is actually changing the script in the coppers' heads as they do their job. Right? You with me? Now that is damaging because the very best police work, the thing we pay them to do, is to keep order. And keeping order means the very best performance of their office is when nothing happens. Now, you don't have to be a journalist to realize that's not going to hold the front page, right? It is the exact opposite of what journalism needs. But the third theory I want to give you uh, tonight to understand this stuff comes from a brilliant American uh, sociologist called Irving Goffman, Irving with an E, who wrote a book in the uh, 60s, I think it was, called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. It's a brilliant book. You can get it for 5p on Abe or something. You know, it's, I can't commend it to you highly enough. And what Goffman was saying, which is brilliant stuff when you're talking to psychoanalysts, as I was <laughs> two weeks ago, saying it's not about what your mother did to you at the age of three or something, or didn't do. It's actually the seeking of pleasure, uh, sorry, of approval and consensus, as I'm doing right now with you, and you will do afterwards in discussing what I've said to each other, right? It is the interaction, the social interaction based on what he calls theater, that I am on stage right now. When we go and have drinks, you will all be on stage with each other. If you go to the loo, you'll be backstage. And backstage, you can do whatever you like. It doesn't matter, especially if you go into the cubicle. But if you're just having a pee, if you're a man you are still sort of on stage. You're you're in the wings. Now, I don't just mean whether there's any kind of competitive show going on. I mean just the way in which you conduct yourself will be watched by other people. And the third theory I want to put to you to put these three things together is that indeed the police and the media, they kind of act for each other. But that the media in question are not the press or television or radio, it's each other that they are the audience for their performance, and they are always performing unless they're alone. So that if you do find yourself or watching filming, as I've done, two coppers just walking together, they are showing off to each other. They're always trying to impress each other. They're never just saying, this is boring. They're always telling stories in which they start ramping up what happened simply to score points or to be impressed, if, or to get the approval. And you may, again, I'm going to do a little test. How many people in the room have ever heard the phrase canteen cowboy? Half of the, the older ones have, right? It's not a phrase that is still alive. But in the, in the 80s, there was this phrase that described the person in the canteen who told the best stories, who was the most racist, who was the most vulgar, who was the most uh, sexist. But because he, it was always a he, was so dominant that the ability of other officers to challenge him was pretty minimal. And when they were challenged, as I found in my, the book I wrote about them, bad things happened because the group solidified around the canteen cowboy 
even though individually they didn't share his values. Okay? And that's the business about seeking consensus. And that's the business about sharing a story, a narrative, which is constructed, not lived, and then becomes self-fulfilling. So that when, for example, the Brixton riots happened, it's a very interesting story. The 1981 Brixton riots happened because two detectives who saw somebody being stabbed in a fight tried to rescue him. But they weren't arresting him. They were rescuing a black guy from a fight on the street in Brixton. But because the expectation of all the black people there had been formed by the treatment they had had over the previous 10, 15 years, and so had all their cousins, aunts, and uncles, and friends, they didn't have in their repertoire of possibility what was actually happening, that the two detectives were just trying to rescue this guy. So they started to beat them up, they started rioting, they, you know, that riot was really very interesting because that's what was at the heart of it. Meanwhile, however, the, the um, special patrol group, the sort of tough cops, had been conducting something with the delicate title Operation Swamp, which was to try and stop as many people as possible, to s stop and search as many people as possible, because to see about um, robbery, street robbery. It was an anti-robbery campaign. Now, out of a 1,000 stops, 100 were arrested, not for having anything on them, but for obstructing justice, for interfering with the policemen in the performance of their duty, right? Which was they didn't like being stopped. 10 out of a 1,000 stops actually had anything on them that was stolen. But the coppers carried on with Operation Swamp right through the riots and after, which is... You have to ask yourself, how could they possibly think that was okay when actually it was the tension they had created and the narrative that they had created in the whole black community that had caused the riot in the first place? But there was no possibility in their minds that that was the case. So they had a different script. They had the script, black guys rob people, we're going to stop them. Now you see how that simplification, that simple narrative which they are carrying around in their heads which comes from Kojak and Starsky and Hutch and all of those things in those days becomes active on the street in a very destructive way. Now, when we were doing the Thames Valley Police Series we were with a traffic cop who uh, was chasing a speeder and suddenly his speedometer collapsed to zero. And obviously he couldn't stop the, cop, the, the driver saying you were going X and Y because he, he didn't have any speedometers. So we pull into the garage of Thames Valley and a man who looks now like I do with gray hair, well, silver hair, says, comes out and says, are you from the BBC? And I said, yes. He said, well, you're ruining our cars. And I thought we've been accused of lots of different things, but ruining your cars, I mean, how do you figure that? He said, well, you show Starsky and Hutch, don't you? And I said, yeah, I, yeah, okay. And he said, well, ever since Starsky and Hutch has been shown on telly, nobody ever gets out of their car and shuts the door. They dive out and slam the door, and even if they're going to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> they're in a movie, right? They're in the movies. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Another example, which was from a panorama we talked about, which was absolutely riveting stuff, um, about what happens when cops kill, when they pull the trigger, and the problem at that point of, sh of, of producing an, an accurate account of where they were standing, how many bullets they shot, all the stuff that you would think that they, as professionals, knew. Well, the red mist hits immediately to the point where there is tunnel hearing, and effectively the brain has so much cortisol in it, it shuts down for a few seconds. They are not there. So what they then have to do is combine with these other coppers to find out what happened, because they weren't there for those few seconds. Now, one of the things this guy from the University of Minnesota demonstrated was that in the, sec the three seconds or two seconds that it takes to pull the trigger, somebody can turn around and go eight feet. 
literally turn around and go eight feet. And so they, when they get shot in the back and the copper said they were facing me, all the police critics say, no, no, he's lying. He's pieced together with his mate. It's all corrupt rubbish. But neither of them were there. <coughs> They're, it's their best guess. And one of the really interesting things that come out of his study is, is, is a very interesting example. Hospital waiting room, role playing, right? Everybody's actors. The two cops are not. They come in. That's not. They know it's a, it's, it's a role play, but everybody else is acting. And they've been called because there's a fight. Oh, no, sorry. They've called because there's an old lady who's causing trouble and they can't get rid of her at the hospital uh, reception. So they, they walk in, man and a woman, and suddenly two guys waiting, sitting down, one in a, in a vest and the other in a, in a lumberjack shirt. Uh, one of them pulls a gun and shoots into the ceiling uh, and starts to shoot, that, to point the gun at the other guy, and at which point the cops, both cops, shoot at him. Now... Well, this is a role play, okay? And they, when asked who was wearing the vest and who was wearing the lumberjack, they both got it wrong. When asked how many bullets each the other one had shot, they both got it wrong. And when they asked how many bullets they had shot, they both got it wrong. Now, that's in a role play. And when you understand how difficult it is to keep track of what you're doing when you are so stressed, when the red mist has turned into this panic, has turned into absence, then the creation of that event has to draw on other narratives, which is where the media come back in. Okay? And the, um, I suddenly blanked, blanked on his name, Harry, do you remember Harry, what was he called, the Irishman who, was, who had this uh, table leg? Harry Potter. No, Stanley, 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 that was his name. Hey, thank you, Harry Stanley. What happened there is a classic example of what I'm talking about. There was, of course, general fear about the IRA. He, this Harry Stanley, who's a perfectly normal family man, has got a table leg which he wants to replace the broken one at home, and he's got it in a bag. Um, he is Scottish, by the way, not Irish, if I remember correctly, and he goes into the pub and orders a drink. And somebody there notices that what he thinks is an Irishman has this long thing in a, in a plastic bag. Okay? But he is already so programmed to expect violence from anyone with an Irish accent that he calls the police. And the police, and he says, there's an Irishman in the pub who's got you know, what looks like a sawed-off shotgun. At which point, the armed police are called and when they find him, and he's just wandered off after having had his drink to go home, and they, they say they said, armed police, but nobody knows for sure because he's dead and the other two, they would say that, wouldn't they? And he turns around and they say that he lifted it in such a way as to look like a threatening um, weapon. And they shoot him, they kill him. Right? But what's so really, in for, in, a couple of things come out of that. One is that neither of them get the distance between him and them right. Secondly, the way he was shot looks like he was shot in the back of the head, not in the front of the head. And various other anomalies um, make it seem pretty improbable. But only if you take my three theories and put them together do you get an explanation that puts you in the heads of those coppers that they were told, just like the people who killed Jean de Menezes, that there was this threatening character there. And if you've got a mindset already tuned to that, it's very, very hard to take a deep breath, stop, and think that you might get killed if you ask the wrong question. And it turns out actually not to be a table leg, but a shotgun. So this is where the interaction between the media and policing really is at its most dangerous. And the riots that happened two years ago were another example of that, where they are convinced that uh, Mark was called again. Okay. Uh, yeah, was, was a, because he was a gang member, he must be dangerous, even though the, box, the gun was apparently in a box in a sock and ended up 20 feet away from the gun. But in both cases, the officers were in the end acquitted because the judge and the jury felt they had a reasonable belief that they were 
in danger. Right? Now, all of those judgments are being informed by the media, all of them. And one of the problems in understanding this is that when you ramp up the anxiety level to terrorism, then it's even harder for anyone to stop and say, actually, hold on, you know, how dangerous is this person? How much should we be waiving civil rights and um, the, the, the human rights, both of the people that you're suspecting and um, the people around you when you come in, as in Forest Hill, for example, mob-handed against some Asians who had nothing to do with the bomb-making factory that they thought they did, along with the BBC and ITV, ITN, and so on, if you remember that. There were a whole <coughs> bunch of people, and, and one of them was very badly beaten up by the cops because they hadn't bothered to stop and find out if they were in the right place with the right people. And that's one of the problems I'm really getting at. The asking of the question, like, did Iraq actually have weapons of mass destruction? You can say, well, you know, it's clear, and there were many signals coming out of Iraq that they didn't, and, you know, Hans Blix was trying at that point to just to be there, be allowed, as he was being a, a, a invited by the Iraqis, to, to see that for themselves. But once the scenario had gone into action with the troops being um, assembled in the desert and so on in January, they, there wasn't an off switch. There was no way in which the, the narrative could be stopped. And now we've got Iraq in this, you know, in this disastrous state because there was no thinking going on. And one of the things that really bothers me about the whole relationship here is the problem of thinking, the problem of a reality test, the problem of getting from the parallel universe into the real universe. Because I think the police actually do a better job than they realize. And they don't get credit for it. And the politicians don't give it to them every time they say, all we are going to measure are crimes that can be measured, right? Like property crime and murders. Very good on murders. And then those are accurate numbers. But the fastest growing area of crime, by far, is cybercrime, with fraud and money laundering. I mean, it's out of control, and it's all over the world. But there are no votes in it, and there's no story in it. And I've been trying very hard as a filmmaker to make a story about global crime and cybercrime for years. It's really hard, because it all happens on a screen like this, and very rarely do they catch anybody. So the kind of key elements in the parallel universe that people need, which is a bad guy you can catch and put away and feel good about, is missing. And quite a lot of the money laundering is done by people who've never had a parking ticket. They are just not on the record. They are not the usual suspects. So the game has completely changed, but the media version of the game hasn't, and therefore the political version of the game hasn't. And the guy, Keith Bristow, who runs the National Crime Agency, gives speech after speech after speech about this. And you do have a feeling that um, it's not getting through because there isn't the narrative in the receptor's head to fit what crime should be. Now, I hope I've made sense to you with these three theories, that the police are themselves feeling that they are on stage the whole time, and that they actually feel that they have to perform for each other, let alone when the media are around. And you, the, how many people in this room have seen my rape film? Have you the rape allegation of rape? Some of you have. Anyway, it's three people in a room look, talking to a woman uh, who doesn't want to be filmed, but who said she's been raped and they don't believe, believe her and they give her a very hard time. The point is they're looking right at the camera. So they are presenting themselves not only to her, and to each other, but to the entire 11 million people who watched that film. Now, they wouldn't know it was that many, but they knew it was us. We were there already. And therefore, what's really shocking about that film isn't that they just give her a hard time, which they do, and that is shocking, but that they were being filmed and knew they were being filmed because they were looking right at the camera the whole time. But I'm also putting to you that the presentation that they are making to us and the camera is one they would have done anyway, because they would have done it to each other. 
the coldness that one of them shows to the woman was demonstrating that she wasn't, he wasn't going to give her any empathy at all because he didn't believe her. The patronizing inspector who asked her if she's on the game, how many men she slept with, would have done that anyway to show that he can handle women like that. And the folksy Scottish DC who became a national figure who gives her a very hard time and then is very nice to her afterwards would have done the same because I spent a lot of time with him and that's what he was like. And interestingly, when we tried to make films after that uh, with the law and the bar, the bar council and so on, everybody said, oh, no, no, you're going to do that to us. You're going to make us look like that Scottish bloke. And nothing I could say to say, look, you know, we actually tried to avoid filming him for about six months because we knew that's what people would think. And we know that people think out there that the media influence people's behavior so that it distorts what they do. Well, the thought I want to leave you, in my experience, is that the influence we have when we are actually present is good, not bad. We make people think about what they're doing and how they're being presented in just a, you know, kind of back of the head way, back of the brain way, because they don't swear. That's the proof we have, that when I'm with them and we're not filming, they swear a lot. And very, very, very rarely do they swear on camera. So that means they're aware of it. And also, having been with them both on and off camera, I just think they think more carefully about what they say and do. So I would leave you with the thought that actually the media are not the bad guys in this pl plot. But at the same time, giving John Yates 16 dinners while he's investigating you for fun hacking uh, isn't a good idea for either party. And that the discrediting that went on between News International and um, the Metropolitan Police would apply to all the other newspapers and police forces around the country, and certainly to the Mirror and other, the Mail and others who were not in the frame. That's a problem, and it is nearly corrupt, and both are feeding each other with the things they think they want. But the trouble is, it isn't close to what we want, which is just nothing to happen, and if that means a no slow news day, so be it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. If, if I could just um, uh, uh, chairman's privilege and, and ask two questions specifically about what you were talking about before we open it up, because you talked a, a little bit about um, your rape film, um, and I would just, if you could just talk a bit more about that, and particularly how it um, had an influence on public policy, since this is part of a media and public sure. policy well, series. It did, it did. It, well, what happened was, and I tried very hard when I, the only copper who said anything about it, I showed it to the three officers. The woman didn't want to see it herself. Um, and all, all three said, that's fine. Yes, that's what happened. Um, she was an unreliable witness anyway because she was slightly mentally uh, handicapped, and that was that, right? No problem. Then uh, we showed it to the chief superintendent of Reading Police Station where we filmed it and to the head of CID. They both said the same thing. Okay, we gave them a great dinner at the top of the BBC. And then what happened is I knew that this was going to be big trouble for them. And the chief constable, Peter Invert, who later got the job at the Met because he'd let us in, said, this is very tough stuff. Can you find another case? And we had tried six cases to get there because at the, in the build-up to the period then, there had been a number of allegations by women against rape and other women's groups saying the police were mistreating rape victims terribly, and the police just denied it. So in the week leading up to our film, the procurator fiscal in Scotland doesn't prosecute three guys who raped a woman under a bridge because he somehow or other doesn't think there's enough evidence. And a woman who has been raped while hitchhiking at 11 o'clock at night in East Anglia, the rapist is given only two years because, and I quote, hitchhiking in a miniskirt at 11 o'clock at night puts yourself at risk and you know, it's completely understandable. And so the, the row that, uh, that grew up around those two cases in the week before our film was shown on the Sunday night was colossal, all over the papers. The, the issue, not our film. And I then said to the Thames Valley, look, you need to hold a press conference on this day before the film saying that you're changing the way you handle rape because you're going to have women do it, you're going to have all that. But, 
and then they, they put out an announcement, that was that. But I had seen women training other women in, in the police to disbelieve rape victims and treat them just as badly. This was the default mode. So when the film on the Sunday itself was coming out, because of the rows of all that, it made the 9 o'clock news before it was shown at 10 o'clock. It was on the 9 o'clock news already. Thatcher asked questions the next day in Parliament. It was shown in CBS News. It was shown on, in Swedish News and so on. Because nobody had ever seen the proof of what the women's groups had been claiming for five years and the police had always denied. Here it was. That was the proof. And then quietly, while blaming the Scottish bloke in particular and Thames Valley in general, all the forces changed that default mode very quietly. And Peter Imbert, five years later, the Royal Television Society said, I think we ought to admit the fact that Roger's film changed our policy. But at the time, they were still in denial afterwards and blamed it all on this, what they would call the rogue cop, just as they blamed um, the rogue, the rogue journalist. journalist for hacking, you know, eight, and with eight victims, which five years later turned out to be 6,347 victims of which 2,000 still don't know that they're victims. And if, if, if I mean, people, people spend a lot of time talking about the relationship between politicians and the press, and they have lots of ways of describing the relationship between politicians and the press. And they, 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 there's a, the, the phrase that's often used is, is kind of um, uh, similar as the relationship between a dog and a lamppost, or you know, yes, various other yes, phrases. Yes. If you had to describe from... from, from know, who's the dog and who's the lamppost? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but if you had to describe the kind of the nature of the relationship between the police and the media, and particularly the way the police see the media, how would you describe? Well, it? I'd say it's a love-hate relationship. The police get more coverage, as I described to you on television, as heroes than any other profession apart from doctors. And in fact, they get many more. But um, the, you know, the, uh, apart from things like Clint Eastwood and you know, Dirty Harry as the sort of tough cop and occasional heroic uh, cops like Serpico against corruption, most of the time they're the good guys, almost all the time. So, you know, the media coverage they get is phenomenal, but it's never enough. It's never enough. And the only things they ever remember are the negative stories. They think the press is out to get them. They certainly think the Guardian, the Independent, is out to get them. But the Times, for example, broke the original corruption stories in the 60s, and they did it with undercover recordings and, um, you know, the co I was around in the early 80s and the late 70s when there was a series called Law and Order. I, I, you're lost, most of you are too young to know. <coughs> but it was all about the corruption that was exposed in the Met. <coughs> and um, lethal stuff. I mean, really, really amazingly powerful. So when I'm in this room with the detectives... And they say, you were the BBC? And I said, yes. They said, did you show Law and Order? Yes. It's crap, total crap. Why? He said, because there's no wallpaper in Scotland Yard. They had wallpaper in that series, right? <laughs> and then one of them said to me, look, I think you have to understand, this was the flying squad, particularly the elite. All of us are bent, he said, because one-third take money, one-third do favors, and the last third know about it and don't do anything about it. Now, I think things have improved on the corruption front. I really do. And I think the police are concerned about this and concerned about the relations with the media. They've, Elizabeth Filkin was commissioned by the commissioner of the Perth Met, who himself, if you remember the story, took a gift of £12,000 worth of Champneys services for his... Um, recovery and didn't think there was anything wrong for a 200,000 pounds salaried public servant to take that negotiated by Neil Wallace of News International hello who we had hired I mean that's where the confusion the, the kind of moral <coughs> they're morally colorblind on this stuff Yates is a really intelligent guy he went to Marlborough you know fast track all of the sort of ideal officer class DAC he has 16 meals with the people he's investigating, then has to resign and now works for Bahrain police advising them. Australia right? Now. No, it's in Australia now. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you. But I mean, he was a friend of mine. I was just shocked 
that he would do that? Because I really liked him and thought he was a thoughtful man. Can you explain how he would do that? Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you obviously know he's in Australia. But I thought he was a really, you know, a cop with a future in the police, not having to sell his soul. Well, it's sort of what you were saying, which I found fascinating, in that it's sort of group thing in a way. Yes. It's, and it's, you know, it's all the funny story of those games you play where you have to remember something and then you whisper something and it changes and goes around. So yeah. It's sort of how they would describe it. Send, like, send three and four points, you're going, we're going to a dance. I saw some research recently that said um, we're actually safer now. Exactly. Um, so uh, when you were saying that group thing, I mean, one of the things also that you didn't mention, which I think is true, is that enormous amounts of people who are policemen and policemen have come from families of policemen and, so they're, and policemen. And so they've grown up with this. They've grown up with a sort of a group thing on how things happen. So they, and my experience in the phone hacking is of them going from an absolute police speak to me to when they have been absolutely protective of me for the last three years and looked after me and found out that I was Of course, yes. You know, and I, you know, we all knew there were crooked cops. But I just found what you said absolutely fascinating that, you know, in a way, for them, I mean, the most important thing is the newspapers want stories because no one's going to buy them if they haven't got all the terrible criminals and riots and these dreadful black people and Muslims and all these other people that's, causing all these dreadful right. problems and these sons of single mothers causing all these problems. Absolutely. I mean, what else have they got to talk about? Exactly. Bad news sells newspapers. But the reason is, it's very interesting. It's because of the drug problem. What, and the drug problem? No, no, yes. No, no, our, all of our drug problem. The, the drug isn't heroin or cannabis or any of that. It's adrenaline. And fear produces adrenaline. And you can get it second, third, fourth hand. You can get it just by picking up the evening standard and saying, robbery's up. You may be safe as you know, houses. But if you read that, there's a little shot of adrenaline that goes in your head. And that's the problem, adrenaline. And it does sell newspapers, no question. We are uh, moving very seamlessly into questions. Um, let's uh, take the question here, and then we'll have a question over here. Well, I certainly have a view about the first part of the question. <laughs> the second is harder. Um, the first part is what I was saying about terrorism. Terrorism has simply trumped all of the civil rights and human rights argument. And people will say, as we argue about this, which would you rather do? Have your, you know, sleep safely in your bed, or protect the rights of, you know, of, 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 of an imam who is spouting violence? You know, that's the way they pose it, which is not the point, and I think to this day, we have never really heard Tony Blair accept the fact that the, the recruiting of, uh, of terrorists was fed by the Iraq war. I mean, I just, it's so obvious, you can't believe that, that he hasn't, but he never has, and he's been put to him many times. So the, there's a denial about that terrorism becomes this uh, kind of magic slate for all the argument and nuances about rights and responsibilities and so on, and suddenly, whoosh, terrorism, boom, we can do what we like, you know, and, and it bulldozes through the, 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 the subtleties. 
how do we change that? That's a really good question. I'd love to hear other people in the audience and what their thoughts are. But I think from what I've seen of attitude change in the police, I can just give you two very particular examples if I have time to do that, right? One is, very interestingly, during the, one of the outcomes of the Brixton riots, by the way, the reference I was going to make was that people up and down the country who had no black people in their areas at all watched the telly and got, formed their attitude about black people from watching them fight with the police in Brixton, right? So that meant that a cop, I, do, I know this, a car driving through Shropshire full of black people was stopped simply for driving through Shropshire and being black, just as, you know, um, Griffiths Jones, you know, as the policeman told by Rowan Atkinson, you know, it's not an offense to wear a loud shirt in a built-up area, and not the night, nine o'clock news. And that, that kind of feeling that really that was a group think that went right across the country. But the Met at least had something which was kind of community relations project or workshop which lasted a week and we filmed it. And what was really interesting is it part of six weeks actually. They were part of the weekend when they spent the weekend with either an Asian or black family, that changed their attitudes. They suddenly changed shoes, changed perspective. They saw what life was like how many times their kids were stopped, how many times they were stopped. They suddenly saw that differently. And that did inform them. And the other example is even more interesting, is that after the, they, they met, does everyone know where Meadowell is and near the North Shields in the North? In the north? They had big riots in 1991. And to his great credit, it was one of those housing estates where they dumped all the problem families. It was called by North Shields police station Pigsville. Charming, yes? And the chief constable then, Stanley Bailey, appointed a sergeant and 11 officers and said, I want you to go and just be on the estate. And the sergeant, as it happens, I was there when he got the job and he asked me, because I'd written a book about this, what do I, do? I'm not a community policeman, well, how do I do this? And I just said, get to know the people. So he sent his guys, this is really interesting, he sent his guys house to house in this place full of villains, families, and and with the hostility that any time they ever called the police, no one would come, 45 minutes, it's a five minute drive. You know, they've hated the police. But when these coppers went under, they volunteered for a start, the 11 volunteered, because this was enemy territory. And when they started saying, is there anything we can do for you? Nobody believed them, right? They just said, what, what do you mean? What kind of a question is that? Bugger off. They said, well, no, you, you know, is, is your roof leaking? Is there, you know, a gas leak? Is there something we can do to, you know, your payments up to debt, your benefits and so on. And that's what they did. They became a kind of social worker, problem solvers, which is the kind of policing I totally support, problem-oriented policing. And they so won the hearts of those local people that they then started turning in their kids when they were doing things that were wrong, <laughs> right? And the level of crime dropped to such an extent that the people in the New York estate next door said, do we have to burn ourselves down to get this level of policing? But they were ostracized by the station. So the coppers changed, but their local force, did, they had gone native, they had crossed over. And that happened a lot during community policing developments in the Met as well, that people would get relationships, build trust, and then the local cops would just stop and search and arrest, just as though nothing had happened. So it's very hard. The default mode is suspicion, paranoia, mistrust of everybody. And I've got a statement in my book where one couple said to me, we hate everybody, pinkos, lesbos, gays, rich people, poor people, students, commies, you know. I mean, you just look at this and say, and you're a copper? You're dealing with the public? You know, that's the problem. They, they, they reinforce each other's prejudices. And that's the problem. Well, Is that county culture that reinforces the worst aspects of, of yes. policing continually? It's all very well, as you say, if you have exceptional advantages when people do get involved in a social case, like here and like you just described. But they are, as you put it, they, they've gone native and they're not, they can't take the whole course with them because that county culture is so deeply ingrained and so resistant to change. So all those fast track, as you mentioned, like your friend John Yates, coming with the best of intentions. Years is that however hard they try, they were 
you can still sink a man into that Well, it is a problem. Thing, which is, so you don't need a red mist to conspire to. No. Uh, you just need to have the ometa that is the standard default mode. Okay, that is true. But even, I think it's tonight, on tonight, 24 hours in police custody, is showing a perfectly ordinary police station in Luton. And the point I was making about people behaving well, I think they do behave well. I think that's actually showing coppers behaving very well in difficult situations. It's not that they can't. They need reinforcement to do so. That's the point. They need praise, encouragement, promotion, all of those things. We have more hands coming up now, so I'm going to take a couple of questions at a time. So we have a question there and a question at the back. And we'll come to you in a second. Just a question here first. Yep. Okay. Uh, also tonight, by the way, is, um, and that's what we've called the Panorama program on well, indeed. But it may have been pulled. Which, which depends entirely, as a matter of fact, scams depend entirely on political operation because you give them their rights to start their ones and so on. The whole things are set up with police. I mean, I think what you say is very broad and it's probably been going on for a long time, but it seems to be the interesting thing about the government inquiry was not that they covered it up and whitewashed it at the start, but that after the shit hit the fan, they put an enormous amount of resources in it into it, and started arresting coppers, as well as journalists, and a whole stream of them are now awaiting trial and being quite savagely dealt with. Now, so coppers who, who were implicated in people dying in custody, nothing happened to them at all, but yes. a copper who sells a story, which might be a story of family interest, but it might be a really important matter of public interest, for a thousand quid to the sun, is going to prison. Now, I mean, that turns your whole story on its head, doesn't it? Can we... Can, yes. I'm going to take another question, just because we've got many hands up. Question in the back. Yeah, um, when I came here, I thought the cities are very too big areas. The UK media is such a broad area. The police is such a broad area. Now I understand the whole thing is about films and cops. And I still don't quite understand what actually the message is of all the, the, the main ideas, what I take out of this lecture now. Can you, can you maybe summarize the... <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, okay, I'll try. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm trying to say that the media and the police create a parallel universe in which crime is their primary focus. It sells newspapers and it excites the cops. They think they're in movies the whole time and act that way. Their real job, which they're better at than they are at crime, is solving problems and keeping order. And the media never write about it because nothing happens. And it's a, almost a philosophical, linguistic problem. How can you write about something not happening? Now, you can do it in particle physics, antimatters, you know, <laughs> people are really working at it at the moment. But even right now, literally as we speak, there are thousands of people in CERN trying to decide whether antimatter goes up or down. Right? And so that, that bit, forget about that. Uh, but that, the, my, my, my point is simply that, that there's this parallel universe and that the police are performing for the media, but the media are not just newspapers and, and so on. They are performing for each other, for themselves. They are seeking approval. They are seeking consensus. And that is very difficult. And it affects the way they behave. And the difficulty that I am encouraging us to tackle is to get them to think as individuals, carefully about the evidence, what they're doing, and what is needed, rather than just what will please either their local police and crime commissioner or the local cop reporters, or make a good story in the canteen. That's that's the point of my lecture. I hope that's made me clear. But I want to answer your point, and that is that there are also there's. A re I'll give you a funny parallel, and you'll like it. I think when uh, John, James Anderton was the chief constable of Ma Manchester, he was part of the, what was then called moral rearmament movement, very, very sort of serious evangelical group. And one of his uh, inspectors decided, I think it was oddly enough in Rotherham, but before Rochdale, um, that he was going to win, curry favor with his chief constable by um, arresting all the prostitutes who were there on the street every night, okay? And suddenly, because they had been allowed to do it and hadn't been arrested, the rate, you know, the sex crime rate made the page of the local paper and it was all over the paper and the MPs started asking questions local you know, council saying 
what is this outburst of sex crimes <laughs> which have been going on for years on notice? And my favorite moment is to imagine is, is Anderton saying to the inspector, back off, let them do it, you know, which he had to do. So I think there's a kind of performance art going on, in the, in the, even though it's costing us 32 million quid, um, about scapegoating the people doing something that up to that point, and this is the last one I'd really like to communicate in a way that I hope will be understood to you. Nobody thought it was wrong. That's why they didn't do anything about it. It was normalized, just like domestic violence in many communities. So one of the problems about policing domestic violence is the same as policing that stuff. They know it's illegal, but they don't think it's wrong. So therefore, the weapons of shame, which are kind of the most powerful tool in the criminal justice system, and a consensus about what should and shouldn't happen, doesn't apply when it's something like that, when it's surveilling journalists and doctors and lawyers. If there's terrorism, it's okay. And they've, they aren't asking the moral question about it because they've decided already the word terrorism is the laissez-passe into that. And in domestic violence, I can tell you, it's the thing police hate to do most because sometimes the victims don't uh, proceed. And one of the reasons the victim don't proceed is that the community closes rank with the offenders. She, the woman, usually it's a woman, has brought shame onto the community. And therefore, the fact that they've been beaten up just is not counted. The shame to the community trumps that, just like terrorism trumps the human rights argument. So I don't know if I've answered your question satisfactorily, but that, I think it was a piece, it was a performance art for <coughs> those of us in the media standards trust. So suddenly many hands are going up. So I'm going to take some questions from this side, and then I'll come across to you guys. I've got a question uh, back there first of all, and I'll take a question here and a question here. <coughs> Sorry, who was angry at them? The police were angry at print media usually, and that seemed to be a, a certain embarrassment about their reliance occasionally on print media to help them detect. And I just wondered if you have seen that and whether you've had any comments on it. I know you're broadcast, but and it could be that that's faded now, but it was very prevalent in the 90s. No, I think no, we're going to take maybe no, a couple more Sorry, I'm sure. Okay. Another question, yeah? Oh, thank you. Um, you were talking about the attitudes of police officers. Do you think this has changed? Because I understand it. Okay, one more, and then, and then I'll see print media graduates. Uh. It's recently been remarked that for me, we are addicted to criminalised things. Oh, yeah. What you've just been describing, actually, is part of that process. Um, and there's just recently, for instance, that somebody was proposing criminalising um, drinking while pregnant. Yes, oh, yes. Uh, That's a serious debate, to yes. To your unborn baby. Yep. Um, That's so another lecture. Print, print media graduates in Okay, that I do think, as what I said earlier remains true, that um, there's a mistrust of the media because the simplification that goes on to sell newspapers doesn't do justice to the complexity of the criminal justice process. Moreover, there is the expectation of conviction, which simply doesn't happen quite a lot of the time. And one of the most interesting things about the phone hacking case, and yes, there are lots of people awaiting trial, but you know, Rebecca Brooks getting off when you know you have to say that seems astonishing in terms of natural justice. Um, lots and lots and lots of people just getting away with it. Um, it's confusing. It's difficult. They've spent 32 million quid on that uh, phone hacking stuff now, and you would have thought there'd be kind of purges up and down the country. Lots more people would be involved. But the real, yeah, I'm sure you would agree that the, my experience in the criminal justice system anyway is that a lot of the time it's just gray area. Witnesses pull out at the last minute, um, there are delays, the police lose the papers. You know, O.J. Simpson got off in, 
They had to, because the police had contaminated the fingerprints and transferring them across LA. You know, I mean, that kind of thing. It just, it's just mortality, but it doesn't make good, simple journalism, and it doesn't make good, simple fiction. Everybody has to be locked up by the commercial break. And you have to feel that justice has been done. Whereas when I was preparing to become a, <laughs> a civil rights lawyer, my, I asked my uncle, uh, who was teaching law, what, what books on justice should I read? And he said, oh, we don't teach justice, we teach law, and they have nothing to do with each other. And that's the first <laughs> lesson. <laughs> so I didn't go into law. But I keep seeing that. Keep seeing that. Graduates? Sorry. Well, you, graduates. So graduates, yes, different. graduates. Now, well, I think the truth is that the critical mass of prejudice against black people and um, uh, gays and so on is changing. It hasn't changed. I mean, only last year in Enfield, you know, a black guy was beaten up in his car, and not by five coppers. And not only did they, they filmed it, and it was, you can actually see it on the Sun website, unless it's been taken down. And they got off because the detective uh, inspector in charge of them said they are good thief takers, and they had reason to believe they were threatened. You see the video, and you say not that much has changed. But I would say, overall, it has changed for the better. It's not cool to be racist anymore, whereas in the 80s it was. Do you want to decriminalize anything? Or, uh... Do I want to decriminalize anything? <laughs> well, I would decriminalize cannabis, class B, class B and class C drugs. I would certainly do that. Go on the most serious point. Oh, I mean, it's not just a media obsession. I mean, I think this is a country that's in love with punishment. I think that rather than, you know, there are choices between punishment and empathy. And I'm a great believer in written a book about restorative justice, about forgiveness. And I, I was asked, my nice story, I was asked by the Cambridge Theological Seminary, what could the police do about crime? As, as I, what could the church do about crime? And I was, on the train out there again, I kept thinking, hmm, this is an interesting question. So I say to 160 trainee priests and the Dean of Divinity at um, Cambridge and the, dean, the prison, the prison uh, chaplain, how about forgiveness? And they all say, well, that's a good idea. We hadn't thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I turn to the, to the chaplain and say, do you ever call your local vicar, the local vicar for somebody coming out of prison and say, would you look after Johnny? And he said, I've given up trying. They don't want to know. They love punishment. They don't love empathy. L last three questions from this side. Um, so we've got here, here, and here. Um, do you think there's a danger of our superstitiously thinking, well, if we're in the world of life, we are we'll be fine? Um, <laughs> of course. Uh, of know, course, of course. It's very easy there. Another thing, um, the society is also changing, and we are now completely intolerant of politically incorrect views. And people can lose their livelihoods because they make a casual remark. Somebody makes a racist joke, perhaps, you know, and it gets reported, and then they lose their livelihood. Whereas 20 years ago, you could say, sticks and stones, my breath hurts, words will never hurt me. Now, words will kill you. Or, if you use the wrong words, uh, you, know, you are beyond the pale. And there is no redemption for somebody who says something which, you know, a lot of people find inconvenient or just as fine. Well, I think the really interesting okay. thing... Sorry, okay, we want to... <laughs> Sorry, just... Hold your question here. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of research in prisons and youth justice, and um, it's coming back to something Mary Ellen said, actually, and that was um, that... The, and, and what you said was that the reality being very, very different to the actuality. For example, and we, any of us who work in criminal justice always think, how can we make the media report crime more responsibly? For example, um, we know that the people who are least likely to be victims of crime are always the ones who are most worried about crime, yes. who have the greatest fear of Little old ladies behind and five locks. Yeah, yeah, it does seem to be that the media is obsessed about stoking this fear of crime. Um, for example, life as being released from prison, yeah. we know they're the least likely to reoffend. Yeah. Yet, you know, sure. there's this huge fear about them reoffending. And it seems to me that the police buy into this, and you yes. say they're actors. They do seem to be 
not only acting that role, but living that reality themselves, they must know it's not true. They must know that crime is reducing. They must know that they're not going to so many burglaries, but they, they seem to have a vested interest. Yes, they do. In Absolutely. Thank you. you know what cognitive dissonance is, yes? Yeah. Take questions here. Yeah. As a past actor <coughs> for 30 years, can I say um, the primary object of an efficient police prevention of crime? That yes. is the word, that the I quite agree. You get the very first time you step into a. Uh, into Absolutely a right. So I don't say you've got it drummed into you, but it's the primary object, and that's what we do. Um, I found it manifestly exciting. I found it absolutely fascinating as well. But the one thing in 50 years' experience I found is senior officers at the very top, act out, commissioners, do not get the blame they should be afforded. Take the, I agree instance, with you. Take the instance of um, crime figures. Are you possibly, uh, you cannot convince me that ACPO and the inspectorate, Her Majesty's inspectorate, which sh that's their job, couldn't find their way around a group of, uh, of figures and the way they recorded, who they recorded. Um, and I would also like to say as a passing shot, Theresa May, a good speech, a terrible speech. I'm not particularly a Federation man because when I saw the Federation reps in front of the um, Home Office, uh, yeah. disastrous, absolutely disastrous. But she blamed all the lower ranks. She never uttered one word of condemnation of senior officers. Yes. They are the problem. And you're sorry if I'm calling Mr. Yates a pinup boy. Two weeks after 7-7, seven, seven, he had his feet up at the oval, sipping tequilas. Yeah. Sure. Can you, no, no, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. I think a very quick question. Is it quick? Yeah, it was just a really quick one. A while ago, you said you are wanting to try and change the behavior of the police. But equally, in your canteen cowboy scenario, you say the people who support the canteen cowboy, even if they don't show these values, would need a whole lot of rewards, promotion, whatever, yes. to change. Well, that's right. I mean, okay, I'll try and do it. Take them all together. Maybe. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Senior officers, ploy. Okay, so mm, changing the culture. It's, it, the numbers, the blame for the senior officers. What was the first question? Because that was the, well, the political correctness question and oh, the, the political correct police buying into the media myths. Okay, now, but I wanted to, I, I, I don't want to lose this point about political correctness. Oh, that was your point. Rotherham and the other places, even Baby P, I mean, it's particularly Rotherham and so on, they were, everyone was saying, we don't want to offend the Pakistani community. That is where political correctness is sick. It's not just bad, it is sick. Because people are saying somehow or other they have a laissez passe because they're, you know, that's what they're like. Or their girls have asked, you know, behave badly. So th there's a way in which, taking your point, the senior people are not taking responsibility for the complexity of the reality that you were just describing, right? They, they, there's a simplification. You won't know this, and you will obviously will. The key performance indicators came in uh, in the. 80s, I guess it was, late 80s, was it? Something like that? Anyway, I remember going to see Charles Clark as the Home Secretary at that point and said, you do realize that these key performance indicators simply mean that everyone will count the things that they can count and ignore the things they can't count, which, by the way, they do in terms of things like rape is not counted in the same way domestic violence. And he said, yeah, I realize that. So you'll get a handbag as 12 crimes with all the lipstick and the combs and things like that because they've got it rather than one crime. He said, I need the numbers to, as a stick to beat the police with. Right? And so everybody then became completely um, fixed on arrests and prosecutions and things on the things, the easy things, what's called the low-hanging fruit. And the complexity, which hopefully graduates and people who, you don't have to have to be graduates, you just have to be emotionally intelligent. And there's some wonderful cops who are not graduates have just simply understand the complexity of human life. You have to understand one thing about being an off a police officer, and I hope you agree with me. It's unlike any other job because people come to you with problems. You can have, you know, you're not just doing your shopping. You know, you always say, can you help me? You would be looking for help. Or you've called to go into a difficult situation. It's 
it's more complicated than any job I've ever seen of any kind. And I've made films about particle physicists and things like that. It's it, it, the whole of human nature is part of yours. That's why it's exciting. But the crime prevention part is impossible to succeed because you can't count it. And once the culture of counting and crime became central, crime prevention just <laughs> disappeared. And that's why, I mean, I'm advocating exactly that. And it was the mantra. And keeping the Queen's peace is what the oath is, says. But, you know, crime takes over. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there. I mean, we've had a, a fantastic number of questions, actually. Uh, more questions, I think, than I've seen in many of these events. So thank you so much to, to, to you all. Um, for those, and as I say, um, there are uh, drinks and uh, and snacks down the hall on the left-hand side of the chapters. But if you would join me in thanking Roger Grave.